So in this lecture of Unit 3, we're going to talk about methionine metabolism and some relevant clinical pearls. So first, an overview of methionine metabolism. So you have this figure in your book, and we'll start here with methionine, and it's converted to s adenosyl methionine, also known as SAM. And we've talked about this in previous lectures. SAM is a methyl donor. And so SAM will meth methylate target compounds such as DNA, RNA, norepinephrine. And so the methyl acceptor, the target compound, will take the methyl group, and that'll produce the product. And then as a result, you'll yield s adenosyl homocysteine. Now, s adenosyl homocysteine is converted to homocysteine, and that yields an adenosine. Now, homocysteine's at a branch point in metabolism. So it can go towards one direction, where you regenerate methionine, or it can go in a second direction here, where it generates propanyl-CoA. So the first half of that is going in this direction towards redirecting methionine, and that involves an enzyme called methionine synthase. Now methionine synthase is labeled in the diagram here as homocysteine methyltransferase. So this, these are the same thing. They're referring to the same enzyme. The enzyme essentially has two names. And so what happens is, is it transfers a methyl group from 5-methyl tetrahydrofolate to the B12 component of the enzyme. So meth methionine synthase uses B12 as a cofactor, so it's bound to the structure of the enzyme, and so it transfers that methyl group from 5-methyl tetrahydrofolate to that B12 component. That yields tetrahydrofolate, and then in the process it takes that methyl group that's bound to the B12 component and transfers it to homocysteine. And in the process, that yields methionine. And then it also regenerates a B12 here. So it takes the methyl, just to review again, it takes the methyl group from tetrahydrofolate, binds it to the B12 component of the enzyme, and then transfers it again to homocysteine to yield methionine. And so that's how methionine is regenerated from homocysteine. And so as you may have gathered, methionine synthase requires vitamin B12. And so if you have vitamin B12 deficiency, you can't carry out this reaction, and you're going to result in elevated levels of homocysteine. Now the other half of homocysteine is degraded to propanyl-CoA, as we show here. So we'll start here with homocysteine. It combines with serine and is converted into cystothionine, which is catalyzed by the enzyme cystothionine synthase and uses B6 as a cofactor. We've bolded the ones that are really important to know here. We have the other ones here just for completeness sake, but the ones in this pathway you really want to pay attention to are the intermediates in bold, and you'll see why that's important in the clinical pearls section. So from cystothionine, you then convert it into alpha-ketobutyrate, and that is carried out by an enzyme cystothionine lyase, which also uses vitamin B6, and then alpha-ketobutyrate is combined with CoA, NAD+, and it, that yields propanyl-CoA and an NADH. And remember, propanyl-CoA is then used in gluconeogenesis. So now some clinical pearls relevant to methionine metabolism. So first, homocystinuria. This is characterized by high levels of homocysteine in the blood, homocystinemia, and in the urine, hence the name homocystinuria. And this is caused by a deficiency in, in potentially a number of things. First, if it, it can be an inherited disorder where cystothionine synthase is deficient. And remember, this is the enzyme that converts homocysteine into cystothionine. It can also be due to a mutation in this enzyme that causes it to have a decreased affinity for vitamin B6, because remember it requires vitamin B6. And so it, you could have a normal level of the enzyme, but if it can't bind this important cofactor, B6, then it still can't carry out its function. The other thing is you could have a deficiency of vitamin B6 in a normal individual, and it could potentially lead to this as well. You could also have a deficiency or mutation in methionine synthase, so that you can't generate methionine back from homocysteine. And since this enzyme also requires vitamin B9 or vitamin B12, you can also develop homocystinuria if you have a deficiency of folate, also known as vitamin B9, or a deficiency of vitamin B12, since they're critical for methionine synthase function. The inheritance of this disorder is autosomal recessive, and what's particularly notable about this disorder is that these patients have a predisposition to coronary artery disease and then myocardial infarction at a very young age, potentially before the age of 30 or 20 even. And the reason for that is homocysteine is very thrombogenic in endothelial cells of arteries, and this results in an increased risk of developing clots, particularly deep vein thrombosis, stroke, and then thromboembolism. Some clinical features. So clinically, these are similar to Marfan syndrome, and this is very often where test writers will try to trip you up. So you need to know these subtle differences between the two. 
And these common characteristics between the two disorders include tall, kyphosis of the spine, and lens subluxation. Lens subluxation is one way you can differentiate this. This is also known as ectopic lentis. So we'll draw a normal individual here. Here's the bridge of their nose. So this is the iris of the eye. This is the lens of the eye. So this is, a, this is how it would be normally, just to give us a base point. So here for homocystinuria, we'll draw the eyes like this. Nose. So as we say here, the lens can sublux down and in, or inferiorly and medially. So you can see the lens down here like this, displaced downward like this and inward towards the nose, or nasally. And then in Marfan's, by contrast, This, the lens subluxes up and out, or temporarily, or superiorly and temporarily, like this. So, out like this. So, this is one subtle way you can differentiate these. Also, homocystinuria patients will exhibit intellectual disability and retardation in comparison to Marfan syndrome, which those patients are typically intellectually normal. And then, homocystinuria patients can also have osteoporosis. Treatment, there's no real good treatment for this, and it also depends on the underlying cause of homocystinuria. So if a patient has cystothionine synthase deficiency, you can give cysteine, folate, and vitamin B12, and then obviously restrict methionine, because methionine is going to eventually be converted into homocysteine through this cycle here. If they have methionine synthase deficiency, you can increase methionine in the diet. If it's a result of cystothionine synthase having a decreased affinity for vitamin B6, you can try to overcome that by supplementing with vitamin B6 and cysteine. And then if they have a vitamin B9 or a vitamin B12 deficiency, you can supplement with whichever respective vitamin they're deficient in. So these last two disorders, cystinuria and cystinosis, don't necessarily involve methionine metabolism, but they are high-yield disorders you could see on exams that involve amino acids. So we'll talk about them here. So two cysteines join together to form one cysteine. And so cystinuria is a result of a defective amino acid transporter that's found in the epithelium of intestines and the proximal convoluted tubule of the kidney. So if we have our epithelial cell here, or we have your basal membrane, which is on the side of the blood vessel, the apical membrane here, which is on the side of the lumen. And so you have this transporter is an apical membrane transporter. And so as a result of that, you have decreased reabsorption, specifically of cysteine, ornithine, and lysine, and arginine. Because remember, there's transporters in these membranes that are responsible for transporting amino acids across them to then helpfully get them into the bloodstream. So normally these would go across the apical membrane and then they would come out the basal membrane into the blood. But if you can't carry out this process, you have decreased reabsorption of all of these amino acids. And so high levels of these amino acids will be found in the urine because of the convoluted tubule and then in the intestinal lumen as well. And so they will not be found in the blood. This is an autosomal recessive inheritance. The way you can diagnose this is do a urine cyanide nitroprusside test and it will be positive. Clinical features, these patients are prone to developing cystine kidney stones, which will form because of the high levels still in the urine, because they're not being reabsorbed in the proximal convoluted tubule. And so these patients will develop the typical symptoms of kidney stones that are due to other causes. So they'll have nausea, vomiting, dull ache, or a colicky pain. They could have hematuria. These stones can also cause things like hydronephrosis or polynephritis. So just to be aware of that. These cystine kidney stones precipitate more so when the urine is acidic or even neutral, but definitely when it's acidic, it's definitely at risk for developing. So the way you treat these is sort of similar to traditional kidney stones. You would administer fluids, you chelate with administration of penicillamine. Now in these cases, you can try to make the urine alkaline or basic, 
with pot- potassium citrate or acetazolamide because remember again, kidney stones are more likely to form in acidic urine. So if you make it a basic urine, you make it less likely for these stones to develop. And the way these stones will appear on microscopy is they have this hexagonal shape like this. They can be translucent or even whitish appearing. This is one of those images, especially for the boards, you want to be familiar with because you could definitely see this on an exam. So lastly, cystinosis. This is a slightly different disorder. It involves a defect in lysosomal transport within cells, which causes the accumulation of cystine within lysosomes. So how this exactly works is, let's say we have a cell like this, and you have a lysosome here, and you have cystine. You would have had protein that would have been endocytosed into the cell, made its way into the, the vesicle, would have fused with the lysosome to further break down the protein into its amino acids. So you break down the protein into cystine, and then cystine, there's a transporter within the membrane of the lysosome through which cystine can be exported into the cytosol. And so in these patients, they have a genetic mutation that results in this transporter being defective, so you can't export cystine out of the lysosome, and so then it accumulates within the lysosome. This is an autosomal recessive disorder, and this accumulation of cystine within the, within the lysosomes disturbs a lot of processes within the cell and results in a lot of different tissue damage. The exact mechanisms of this are not clearly understood, but what is known is this can result in impaired kidney function and polyuria, growth retardation, neurocognitive disability, can result in diabetes and thyroid dysfunction, and these, these cystine, as they accumulate, they can form crystals. And when these crystals accumulate, they can accumulate within the cornea, which can result in corneal dysfunction within the eye, which causes the patient to have photophobia, and then eventually the patient can develop blindness. So the way you treat these patients is you administer cystamine. And so this is a molecule that can enter the cell. It enters into the cell and then it can then go into the lysosome and bind to cystine. And then by binding to cystine, this complex between cystamine and cystine can then leave the lysosome and, then, and thus prevent accumulation of cystine within the lysosomes. Cystinosis can lead to the development of Fanconi syndrome, renal tubular acidosis, and hypophosphatemic rickets. All right, so that concludes our discussion of methionine metabolism and some relevant clinical pearls, and also our discussion of cystinuria and cystinosis.